So we're really excited to hear about how you lost 500K. I mean, what, what, whatever currency that is, uh, I'm slightly scared. I don't know about you, yeah, Brian. Yeah, absolutely. If I lost 500,000 of anything, I think I'd be terrified. It's in uh, it's in USD, unfortunately. Oh my god! <laughs> oh no! Yeah. Oh goodness! Uh, well, I'm excited to learn from your mistakes. Uh, so, without any further ado, let's take it away. Cool. Well, first of all, thanks. And I have to say, before we begin, unlike every other amazing talk at this conference, you're probably going to learn absolutely nothing from this one. So, hopefully, uh, I didn't get your hopes up too much. But yeah, uh, I'm here to basically share the story of how I personally lost uh, $500,000 US in around five minutes. So uh, a little bit about me. My name's Randall. I lead DevRel and community at Sneak. If you haven't heard of Sneak, you should absolutely check it out. It's a cool service. Um, but my background, just so you know, is I do a lot of Python, JavaScript, and Golang development. Um, I've been doing open source my whole life. I used to work on the OpenBSD project back in the day. And for the last... I want to say like 10 years or so, I've been doing a lot of web security tooling and things like that. I'm also an author and a builder. So I've built and, and run and currently manage quite a few developer uh, services on my free time. So here's the background of the story. This took place in about 2008. And this is me as sort of a young developer. I'd actually, uh, the way that this ended up playing out is I had dropped out of university. I got my first tech job working at a, a telephone company down in Los Angeles, where I'm from. And shortly after that, I learned a lot about the telco space and ended up joining as a partner with a few guys who were building this free conference calling uh, service. And so I came in as a partner. So my job was to essentially be like a startup CTO and build and architect the services and just really scale the business up. And so the way this service worked is we were offering free teleconferencing to people so they could go to a website and say, hey, I want a free teleconferencing number. They would get a dedicated phone number and they could call in and just use it as a conferencing platform. So nothing fancy. But the way that this all functioned on the back end is that we would partner with these rural telecom providers out in the middle of nowhere around the US. This is places like Copley, Pennsylvania, Lufkin, Texas, places where you have to fly into a big city, rent a car and then drive for a few hours to get there. and Essentially, what would happen is these rural telecom providers were um, incentivized by the U.S. government to uh, build out infrastructure in the middle of nowhere by essentially getting paid a certain amount of money per minute for phone calls. So like imagine you're this telecom provider in the middle of nowhere, Texas. You're not really incentivized to set up Internet and phone access to customers there because there's not enough customers to make you money. So the government would say, hey... If you do this, we'll pay you 50 cents per minute that uh, for any call that comes in to your local like telecom, essentially. And so what we would do is we would partner with these rural telecom providers and we would say, hey, look, we have this popular service that generates a lot of inbound calls. So why don't you give us like free hosting space at your like, you know, rural data centers, give us a bunch of phone equipment. And what we'll do is we'll provide this amazing free service and split the government subsidies with you. And so because of that, uh, our service was pretty popular at the time and we were just printing money like crazy. So the biggest problem with this business model was payments. Getting payments was actually really tricky. And the reason why is because let's say our service was used, uh, used about 2 million minutes a month. Um, well, that was just part of the amount of like phone minutes that were used by this rural telecom, right? Because there's also local subscribers, other businesses, et cetera. And what, what that telecom provider would do at the end of the month is essentially dump all the logs from these old Nortel DMS 100 switches into like a calls.csv file, send it to the government via this whole application thing and get back a subsidy check. But the problem was that they didn't know how much to pay us because these are not like highly sophisticated technical operations. These are like rural telecom providers with like a couple people on staff who are for the most part just keeping the lights on, doing basic IT work. So not very knowledgeable about how to segregate our traffic out from the rest of their customers, because this was a very custom partnership. So how we got paid was essentially what we did is we generated our own call logs. We would send those to the telecom provider at the end of the month. They would match it up against the logs that they had consisting of all of their customer uh, call logs. Then once they validated that like, okay, these make sense, they would cut us a check for our half of the subsidy money and that's how we got paid. So now let's talk about the architecture. So how did I build and architect this platform? 
Well, essentially the way it worked is something like this. There is a conference calling web application, which is the web front end, you know, users would go to view the website, get a new conference number. And it was backed by this conference call API service that I'd built in Python. Now that API service spoke to these asterisk servers that we had also built. And just so you know, asterisk is like a free open source application. You can run it on any sort of Linux or BSD operating system. And basically it's like a programmable phone system of PBX. And so the way this worked is that all the web application side of the things was hosted in Rackspace in, in the cloud. And then all of these actual telecom servers we had were basically stored you know, around the country in these rural data centers. And when a phone call came into one of these phone lines, uh, the call would basically be routed to one of these asterisk servers. And the very first thing we would do in the asterisk code is fire off an HTTP request to the API server. And what the API service would do is immediately log this as a billable call. And so it'd be constantly getting these like API requests saying new call from this number to that number. And basically this is what allowed us to eventually generate like a calls.csv file that we would eventually get back to collect our money <laughs> at the end of the day. So how did things get screwed up? Well, what I just showed you in this architecture slide is almost verbatim how things were built. I might be oversimplifying a few things, but for the most part, this is exactly the way it worked. And keep in mind that in the model I just described, there's not really a great way for me as like a, a service operator and developer, like a DevOps type person, there wasn't a great way for me to like pull projections and say, hey, look, you know, we're one week into the month and we've served X amount of calls for Y amounts of minutes. That means we can expect, you know, Z amount of revenue. We didn't really have that. And so what I would do is I would basically on my laptop every Friday night, I'd essentially do this. I would run an SCP command and I would literally just copy this massive calls.csv file from the API server. There was just a single one of these at the time. This was not redundant at all. Everything was deployed via like this puppet master daemon that I would push things to. So it was like really janky DevOps stuff uh, back in the day. But anyways, uh, skipping skipping through some of that jankiness for a moment. I would literally type this out on the command line. I would copy the calls.csv file from the main server onto my laptop, count the amount of calls that there were, just sanity check things, and then send a report to my partner saying, hey guys, we're on track to do like 2 million in revenue this month, something like that. So I go to get a drink and I, well, I started running this command, excuse me. Then I go get a drink. It takes about five minutes to run because this is like a pretty massive file and this is 2008, mind you. And when I come back to the computer, I'm taking a look at the output and I'm saying, okay, uh, let me just take a look at how many calls we're at here and just make sure everything makes sense. And uh, I immediately start thinking, okay, this is a little bit weird because we have the same number of calls as last week. And what I remember very specifically about the situation is that it was the middle of the month. So it was like, we we're almost perfectly halfway through the month. And when I saw that the number was the same as the prior week, I was thinking to myself, that's sort of weird. But then I thought about it more and I was like, wait, how is that possible? Because if it's the same as last week, that means we would have had to do absolutely zero new calls over the last week, which I know for a fact did not happen. So as I'm looking closer, I'm like hitting the up arrow in my terminal or whatever, right? And what I notice is I'm like, oh my God, I reversed the SCP command arguments. <laughs> uh, it, it gives me pain just talking about it. I copied the prior week's call logs that I downloaded to run an estimated report and overwrote the production copy of this calls database on the live web server that was processing all of these transactions. And so I basically flipped the table out. I was you know, working from home, obviously. I've like flipped my shit, sort of like screamed into a pillow for a minute, regained my composure. But essentially, that small mistake in reversing those SCP arguments literally cost me $500,000 US. And let me give you a little background on this, just so you understand where this is coming from. This company was like very new. We had been in business for maybe six months or so. And to lay this out for you, the business model we had, in my opinion, was awesome because, you know, the subsidy money is really great. We have a free service and you're basically making money on a free service that's very profitable, which is fairly rare. And so we were thinking this is amazing. But unfortunately, running a service like this also has a ton of hardware costs because I would literally have to like buy a ton of these Dell 1U rack mount servers, install all of our software on it manually, fly out to the middle of nowhere in all these different places, drive to the data center, 
work with the IT people there who are not at all familiar with this stuff to get the infrastructure set up, plugged in and running. And it was an absolute nightmare. So we'd basically on credit cards, put a ton of money for this equipment. And we were just getting to the point when this happened, where we were like pretty close to paying all those loans off and would actually break into profitability. And for reference, I was maybe 20 years old at the time. I was, uh, you know, definitely did not have $500,000 laying around. So this was like a really big deal. Now, for those of you watching, you're all very knowledgeable, obviously. So you're, you're probably thinking, okay, well, it sounds like you made a stupid, dumb mistake and you did something <laughs> really stupid, but why didn't you just get this data to replicate those call logs from the rest of your infrastructure? Like for example, I could pull the logs in from asterisk logs and var log. I could pull them in from probably like my Apache web server logs at the time and reconstruct things. You know, it may not be perfect, but I could probably do that, right? Well, the problem and the reason why I was not able to do that and we actually lost this money like for reals, for reals, was because the first time we set up in a, one of these rural data centers, I actually flew out, set everything up like I just described and things went pretty great. I flew back home to Los Angeles and was, you know, things were going well for a few weeks. And then out of nowhere, one day, all of our infrastructure goes completely dark, goes completely offline, our service is down. So I called up the data center. There was like a 24 seven IT person there. And I said, Hey, can you go restart my server? And they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And so these are not again, sophisticated data centers with like, that are used to doing remote hands work. We didn't have any like really nice KVM or remote access system set up. So it was very rough. So I hopped on an emergency flight, flew back out there. And when I went out, I realized the reason the servers all went offline is because asterisk had logging enabled. And these servers are processing millions of calls a month. And so these logs would fill up pretty quick. And this was back in 2008 when the disk drives on these things was maybe like, I don't remember exactly. I'm just going to estimate it was like 80 gigs, 160 gigs, something like that. So there wasn't a ton of space on these things. So when I went out there to do this maintenance work, I said, you know what? These servers should all be ephemeral anyways. I'm just going to purely disable logging for asterisk 100%. Now, of course, we're already logging things via the central API. So like, why would I keep these logs around anyways? Like, you know, why not just get rid of them? So that's what I did. And when I got back home to LA and I was working on our web application side of things, I also said, you know what? I got rid of the logs there. I don't want our web server to blow up for because of the same problems. So I just completely turned off Apache logging as well. So I completely like nixed any opportunity I had to reconstruct these things like months before this incident ever happened. So yes, it was a really dumb, stupid thing that I did. And it's very embarrassing to talk about. So what did I learn through this experience? A few things. So one, definitely store your logs. Um, after this incident, I actually learned a ton about syslog D and doing streaming log backup and, and, and stuff like that. Um, later on, when services like Logly and Paper Trail and Log DNA and you know Amazon CloudWatch and like basically everything else that you can do to potentially store logs, just whatever you're doing, please do it for my sake. The second thing I learned is that you always want to use code to communicate. So in my case, for example, one of the things I screwed up is I was manually running these SCP commands to like check on stuff, right? Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily a right or wrong thing to do, but if you're going to do it, you might as well codify it. So what I would have done going back, had I done this the proper way, is I would have at least at the bare minimum written a Python script so that I could run like Python, you know, check call logs, you know, dot pi or something, which that would have then shelled out to execute the SCP command at the absolute minimum. That way I'm not running these things one off and having an opportunity to completely screw myself over. So always use code to communicate. And the third thing is that it's worth taking your time to do important things. So that story I just told you makes me look like an absolute idiot, but I assure you, I was actually very knowledgeable about a lot of these things when I did this, my mindset at the time thinking back was that I was thinking, Hey, I'm very responsible for this application. There's a lot of money coming in here. There's a lot of users. Like this is something that we need to do. And there's a lot of pressure and responsibility to get stuff out quickly, to keep iterating, to add features, to do all this work. You know, I was on planes flying around doing all sorts of stuff as well. And it was very stressful. And my thought process at the time was like, why don't I just do this as hacky as possible and I'll, I'll refactor and deal with things later. So that's why it ended up this way. And so one of the big lessons I learned was just take your time on things when they're important. Not everything, but for the important things for sure. 
And the final thing is that, you know, all these experiences really turned me into like the dev SecOps fanatic that I am today. Um, after this incident, this really got me started down the path of like building reliable software, taking my time, like doing tons of testing on everything. Uh, how do you, you know, use configuration management software in a better way than what I was doing at the time? And so it was a good learning experience. So in short, don't be an idiot and do what I did. I hope you enjoyed the story. Um, if you'd like to hear some more fun stuff like this, you can always check out my personal website. I have a blog on there where I do a bit of writing about things like this. It's rdegs.com. You can also uh, check out sneak.io if you're interested in learning about vulnerability uh, management and fixing. And you can follow you know, SneakSec on Twitter as well. So thanks a bunch for the time. I appreciate it, everyone. Thank you so much for that, Randall. Um, I mean, Brian and I had our heads in our hands uh, for, for quite a lot of that uh, in the nicest way possible. Uh, Brian, what was the thing that hurt you the most? Um, I would probably have made the same mistake with the SCP command. Uh, <laughs> like, 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 I was like, huh? That is correct, right? Oh, probably is correct. Oh, it wasn't correct. Oh, my God. And then it was just like this. Yeah. Uh, and I would I would probably do to do the same like I totally understand the, the 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 getting rid of the logs at that point in time that you don't want to overflow your stuff like oh yeah I probably would have made that same same mistake in here and well you said you we probably wouldn't learn a thing I think we learned a ton of things like how not to do certain things like logging is important and everybody says that and but now you feel it um, this is horrifying man. It, yeah, it's it, it. I mean, I very much resonate with the logs piece. I very much think that I could be in that position. I'm going, yeah, don't need that. Just flinging it back. Oh, it's well. brutal out there. Thank God there's DevSecOps stuff now with like proper information and people doing the right thing all the time and caring about these things. If you're in the audience, you're already so far ahead of like, I would say most developers out there, you're like on the critical path already. So good job. <laughs> I, I, also, I also think like, uh, now we're in a much better place as we can, by default, you put something in somewhere in a cloud and do that, that, that remotely, but that doesn't take up the edge that we need to be aware of new things that can happen in a similar way that, that the things that you did, uh, could harm you. But, uh, yeah, this was, uh, this was an eye opener. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Thank you so much for your time there, Randall. Thank you for having me, gentlemen, and take it easy, everyone.